Hello and welcome to this edition of Wineskins. I'm Father Jim Cordell. Wineskins is a program that features reflections on the lives of the saints and the sacred scriptures, along with a variety of issues and topics, all from a Catholic perspective. Wineskins is brought to you through the annual Diocesan Appeal, the Catholic Communication Campaign, and St. Paul's Catholic Books and Gifts, a division of the Society of St. Paul. On our program today, I will interview Bishop Bonner on his pastoral letter. We will also hear more information on St. Patrick and today. As the Church celebrates the fifth Sunday of Lent, we will get a deeper insight into those particular Sunday readings. That and more on Wineskins. Catholic Charities is an important part of the life of the Church and her members. To share with us an important issue is Rick Squires. With me is Rick Squires, who is the Executive Director of Catholic Charities Regional Offices for Portage and Stark County. Welcome to our show. Thank you, Father. Thanks for having me. You know, we're going to talk about an issue that's very important for us as human beings, not just as Catholics, but as human beings, and that is the environment. And we know that Pope Francis has addressed that issue in several encyclicals and documents, recently even. What does that have to do to us here in the Diocese of Youngstown? How does that affect us here? When we look at climate change, sometimes, and I get drawn into this, is seeing it as a global issue and those that suffer being a long ways away. Mm -hmm. However, I think we can take a look and we can see the impact on a local basis too, based on fires, floods, and food shortages. Mm -hmm. And those impact people in our immediate community. Those that don't have the means to pick up and move or to kind of get past the immediate problem, those are the ones that suffer the most. And those are the people that we serve we serve those that don't have the means. So there's a close correlation. And I think if we look back at what happened in East Palestine and the train derailment, Mm -hmm. those people that were not able to pick up and move were the ones that suffered. And those are the ones without the means to do so. Mm -hmm. Typically, women and children are the ones that suffer the most because they tend to have fewer means than everybody else. You know, we've talked about the environment for a long, long time, and gratefully, the Holy Father has spoken out courageously about this, so we know this is an issue. So what are we doing to try to address that issue? What are kind of the nuts and bolts of our work to help that and to help those most in need? From a Catholic Charities perspective, we kind of help with food assistance. That's the most immediate thing that we can do. When there is an emergency, we can say we have the food and we have the location to distribute those things. Uh, We also help with means of housing as well. That's a major portion of it. But from a bigger perspective, I think we have a responsibility to kind of build awareness of that these things happen. We are the face of social services for the church So we have the responsibility to say, this is what we're doing and this is why we have to do it. I think it becomes part of who each of us are as a Catholic and a faith-based people of saying, this is how I'm acting because this is the impact it has on my brothers and sisters. Who is my brother and sister? Maybe not being the one that is here immediately now, but our brothers and sisters are those that are going to be suffering in the future Mm -hmm. if we don't change what we're doing now. And there are just little steps Pope Francis called for us to make little changes to make an impact on global warming. So I think each of us has to do that from a perspective saying that this will have an impact on men, women, and children on down the road. If it's not next year, it's 20 years from now. The things that I'm doing today are the things that I trust are going to make the world a better place then. How do you share that reality and those issues with those that you actually serve? Is it important for them also to know that the church is doing this because of these particular issues that affect them personally? Does that make sense? So I'm not sure that when somebody is in extreme need, I'm not sure that the reason behind the way we operate matters to them, if that's fair, because they're coming to us with, I need this right now. Mm-hmm. I need food right now. I need my electric bill or mm-hmm. diapers mm-hmm. paid right now. So I'm not sure they do, but if we know what we're doing and why we're doing it, I trust that it does have a larger impact because we are an example. This is how we act and people see how we act and then 
hopefully they follow suit and do the same. And of course, we're in the Lenten season, really kind of on the heels of Palm Sunday, Holy Week, and Easter shortly. Mm -hmm. So what can we do in a nutshell during the season of Lent to heighten our own awareness to these important environmental issues? I think addressing environmental issues is something that is absolutely a Lenten practice. Mm-hmm. There should be a Lenten practice. Back when I was the director of faith formation at St. Joan of Arc in Streetsboro, our generations of faith families, we had a Lenten plastic challenge. Mm-hmm. And their challenge for Lent was to see how much they could reduce their plastic intake. Sure. And I think that's a simple one, and Mm -hmm. I think kind of Mm -hmm. if families aren't already there, it's something that they can take on. But really, if you look at it, I think some of our classical Lenten practices align perfectly with the environmental issues that we're looking at. So, Mm -hmm. for instance, a meatless Friday is a fantastic way to cut your carbon footprint because you're not consuming beef or other meats Mm -hmm. that are extremely impactful on Mm -hmm. the environment. So just changing in over to a vegetarian diet once or twice a week has an impact. Pope Francis said, little changes matter. He said it in one of his addresses on the negative side, but uh, you have to trust that on the positive side, it works as well, Mm -hmm. that if we do just a little things that change, that they will have impacts on down the road. And that's what I'm kind of a fan of saying, if I change something, I trust that that is making things better on down the road. Certainly words of wisdom to live by, and we appreciate your presence here on our show and enlightening us not only of the importance of environmental issues, but but why we need to be servants of those issues and bring those about for the betterment, not only of those that we serve who are intimately affected by that, but because we want to be good stewards of this earth and the blessings that God has given us. So Rick Squires, Director of Catholic Charities for Portage and Stark Counties, thank you so much for being with us, and God bless you, and have a happy Lent. Thank you, Father. For Wineskins, I'm Father Jim Corda. St. Patrick was the Apostle of Ireland. To tell us more is Rachel Herbelich. She is from St. Mary and St. Joseph Church in Newton Falls. The Apostle of Ireland was born in Britain. At the age of 16, he was kidnapped by pirates and sold into slavery in Ireland, where he was assigned to the care of the flock as a shepherd. There also, he learned the Celtic language and was converted to the Catholic faith. Later, he fled to France, where he became a disciple of St. Germain and visited the monastery near Caen. He spent 15 years there and then was ordained to the priesthood. Sometime thereafter, Pope Celestine I sent Palladius as a missionary to Ireland, but he died there within a year. Consequently, St. Germain ordained Patrick Bishop so he could pick up the work started by Palladius. Patrick arrived in Ireland around 432. He converted some of the chieftains and was very successful in adapting the gospel to Irish culture. Ireland is the only country in Western Europe in which the church was established without martyrdom. A few years before his death, Patrick convoked a synod and turned over the government of the church in Ireland to other bishops. It is believed that he died on March 17, 461, and was buried at Saul on Strangford Law, where he had built his first church. Although he was venerated in Ireland and England for many centuries, his feast was not listed in the Roman calendar until 1632. The first part of the opening prayer of the Mass is new. It states that God sent St. Patrick to preach the gospel to the people of Ireland. Patrick had always considered that mission as a great gift from God. In the second part of the opening prayer, we ask that all Christians may proclaim God's love to all. The Italian version also asks that we may rediscover the missionary aspect of the faith. And the Latin text asks that we may glory in the name Christian. Like Patrick, We should be grateful for our Christian heritage and strive to share with others the joy of our faith. The opening prayers read, God our Father, you sent St. Patrick to preach your glory to the people of Ireland. By the help of his prayers, may all Christians proclaim your love to all men. The alternate opening prayer reads, Father in heaven, you sent the great Bishop Patrick to the people of Ireland to share his faith and to spend his life in loving service. 
May our lives bear witness to the faith we profess and our love bring others to the peace and joy of your gospel. For Wineskins, I'm Rachel Herbalich. Welcome back to our show. I'm talking with Bishop David Bonner. We've been talking about the pastoral letter, practicing faith, hope, and love, living the virtues together in tough times. We're going to focus on love now, that power of love. You know, oftentimes when I've had a funeral mass and I've said to people, God is love, and it's a difficult thing to understand when we're grieving, when we've lost someone we love. Why is love such a powerful virtue that really guides and directs everything and who we are? Love is God. You're right. Mm -hmm. God is love. And there's a mystery, there's a majesty, there's a moreness to that that just defies words. I remember as a kid growing up, my sister and I would race to the front door every afternoon for the evening newspaper. And I would go to the door waiting for latest sports news, and she was just so fascinated by this one, it was a cartoon of sorts, and it was entitled Love Is. Mm. And every day there was an image of what love is. And every day, for example, love is cooking a meal for your loved one. Every day it was something different. Mm -hmm. That really impressed me in the sense that love is, it's hard to concretize. I mean, Mm -hmm. look how many songs, how many poems, how many movies center around love. It's more than we can ever think or dream of. You know, I love the great command to love. Love God above all else and love your neighbor as yourself. That's really a general commandment. But then Jesus says, love one another as I have loved you. There's an added dimension to that. And I'd like to kind of say that love your neighbor as yourself is really kind of a general human way of love. Loving one another as I have loved you is the Catholic Christian way of love. So there's something more intimate about that. Why is it important for us as followers of the Lord to love others as he has loved us, and how has he loved us? It's important because love is incomplete without accompaniment and without mm-hmm. suffering. When we, if we truly love someone, we have to be open to suffering f- with mm-hmm. them and for them, just as Jesus did for us on the cross. To love one another as he loves us is also to forgive. When I did weddings as a parish priest and did many weddings in my life as a parish priest, but in every homily, even though they all were different in their own way, but in every homily, I would always take a moment and invite them to gaze at the crucifix in the sanctuary and to let them know that this is what love truly is and that love is incomplete unless you're able to say, and pray what Jesus said and prayed. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. Mm -hmm. Forgiveness is the fullness of love. And if we can't demonstrate that forgiveness, then we're not loving as God desires us to love. It reminds me of, of a poem that was written many years ago about an elderly priest who goes into a darkened church, and he tells his folks, I'm going to talk about the love of God. And he pulls out a ladder and a lantern, and he climbs to the crucifix, which is hanging above the altar. And he shines the lantern on each of the five wounds of Jesus. Then he comes down into the sanctuary and breaks a silence and says, can we do any less? Mm. That's the love of God. Can we do any less? He's given his life for us. So how much more should we be giving our life for others? And that's really kind of the sense of unconditional love. You know, there's different kinds of love. There's love of brothers and sisters, love of family, love of spouses, but this unconditional love of God that he loves us no matter what. Now, when you hear something like that, that does something to the human heart that nothing else can really do. How do we really understand that God loves us no matter what? That's a hard lesson for Mm -hmm. us as human beings to embrace. But for me, what always brings it home is every time I avail myself to the sacrament of reconciliation. Mm -hmm. When after confessing my sins, my brokenness, I hear the priest say, and I absolve you of all of your sins. Mm -hmm. There was a person in our tradition many, many years ago, I don't recall which saint it was, but 
He said, confession is none other than the kiss of Christ. Mm -hmm. It's Christ's embrace of us, mm -hmm. no matter what. With all of our warts, with all of our scars, with all of our blood, sweat, and tears, he's loving us. And we can only love to the extent that we allow ourselves to be loved mm -hmm. by God himself. You know, we're loved by him, not only in that sacrament, but also in the Eucharist. When we approach the altar and mm -hmm. receive the Holy Eucharist, it's another way of Jesus saying, I love you. And then we need only to look around at the people in our lives who show their love to us. God is present there because where there is love, there is God. Mm -hmm. One of the words that comes to mind as you were talking is humility. You know, how often we really lack that virtue of humility for whatever reason. But if we're truly going to love one another as Jesus has loved us, and we're going to love our neighbors, we love ourselves, that demands humility. We must stand empty, naked before God with nothing else, just knowing that he has first loved us. And then there's that sense of accompaniment. You've mentioned this often. Why is that sense of accompanying one another on the way to the kingdom as pilgrims so crucial for us? Love is not meant to be exclusive. Mm -hmm. It's not meant to be hoarded or kept in isolation. Mm -hmm. Love is at its fullest sense when it is shared and when it grows. And that's the beauty of community, when we allow that love to permeate our circles of life, mm -hmm. be they family or parish. Let's go back and kind of recap faith, hope, and love. We know that the greatest of these is love. Why is that the greatest? Why love? Why charity? Why is that so crucial to who we are, not only as human beings in general, but as Christians in particular? I think the short and simple response is because God is love. Mm. Love is God. Love is God incarnate. Every time we love, we reveal the face of Christ, the heart of Christ. Mm. And that's why it's the most important, because Love shows Christ to the whole world. And as we find ourselves as pilgrim people on the way to the kingdom, we want to certainly understand that theologically in those virtues of faith, hope, and love, that we're united with God, we're united with one another, we're united in the church, and that is what is calling us forward to be his people. Those of you who are with us, that would like more information on the pastoral letter, which is entitled, once again, Practicing Faith, Hope, and Love, Living the Virtues Together in Tough Times, can go to catholicecho.org. Did you know that the Catholic Echo magazine is delivered 10 times per year to 52,000 Catholic households in Northeast Ohio? That is more than 150,000 people. And the Catholic Echo website, catholicecho.org, has been averaging 30,000 views per month since it launched in February 2023. Advertise your business, special event, or service with the Catholic Echo in print or online. Email catholicecho at youngstowndiocese.org. Advertising discounts are available for Catholic institutions, as well as for businesses that commit to five or ten issues in a year. Email catholicecho at youngstowndiocese.org or visit the advertising tab at catholicecho.org for more information. Church World Service believes that being self-reliant is a joy everyone should share. So around the block or around the world, share the joy. 33 million Americans have descended into poverty. And as their futures fall, so does our nation's. Our song today is from the CD called Lent at Ephesus. It is by the Benedictines of Mary.
As we celebrate this fifth Sunday of Lent, we will hear more about the sacred scriptures by Father John Rovnak. He is a parochial vicar at Holy Family Church in Poland and Holy Rosary Church in Lowville. In our first reading today, we hear from the book of the prophet Jeremiah. We hear a story of hope and consolation in a time of darkness and trouble. And as we're traveling through this journey of Lent, we are fasting and penitential. It can seem, even with the weather outside, as dark and dreary as it often is here in Northeast Ohio, it can seem like we are traveling through the darkness, through this dreariness. But for Jeremiah, it was much more imminent. It was much darker. His hometown, the city of Jerusalem where he was ministering and living with his friends and family, they were all in trouble as the armies of the besieging Babylonians were surrounding the city. The time of persecution for them was very much at hand. And it was something that he needed to inspire hope. And as he prayed, he received this message from God that this is not the end. This is not what I promised you. A time is coming in the future where my covenant won't need tablets of stone. It won't need to be kept in the temple. It'll be kept in our hearts. That the evilness of the world is going to be washed away. And as we fast forward over to the gospel, we see Jesus with his disciples. They're getting ready for Passover. We know the time is at hand. We know the story what's going to be coming next week with Palm Sunday into the Passion. It's preparation that's happening now, and a surprising thing has happened. Some of the Jews from the outlying districts outside of Jerusalem, outside of the Holy Land, have come in, and they have now heard of Jesus in Alexandria, Egypt, in Rome, in what is now modern-day Turkey. They've heard of this great miracle worker, this great preacher, and they would like to see him. His name is is already spreading. And for Jesus, this is an indication that the time is at hand. He knows what's going to happen and what we will consider just a week, but for him, it was going to start in just a few days and really a few hours. That his time was at hand, that he was doing God's work, and that he was doing it well. And as verification of this, a voice came down from heaven, and the crowd was amazed, the disciples were amazed, but more importantly, the devil was amazed. For it is this moment that he has been fearing, that his dominion over the world is ending and that he is going to be driven out. Yet he thinks he's going to win as the Son of Man, Jesus Christ, as we know, will be crucified. But is that crucifixion, that death, that leads to our salvation? The darkness never lasts forever. There is always light. And we trust in that light. We trust in that hope. And as we continue through the darkness of Lent, let us look forward to the light, the hope, and mercy that comes with the dawn at Easter. For Wineskins, this is Father John Rovnak. His cross is there. It has taken hold of our lives, and we can never completely escape it. But we need to know that in that cross, and in the things for which it stands, lies the most genuine happiness that any of us can ever know. Wineskins is a production of the Roman Catholic Diocese of Youngstown. It is brought to you by the annual Diocesan Appeal, the Catholic Communication Campaign, and St. Paul's Catholic Books and Gifts. I'm your host, Father Jim Corda, wishing you a beautiful week. have you done for your marriage today? I gave my wife a hug this morning. I thought uh, I love her. I uh, did her hair this morning. It <laughs> looks pretty good. I cooked my husband's uh, favorite breakfast. I bought her an orchid. What have I done for my marriage today? I sent my husband a love email. I read the newspaper to my wife and it cracked her up. She's, but she's still laughing. <laughs>
<laughs> what have you done for your marriage today? Make a change for the better. Need help? Go to foryourmarriage.org. A message from the Catholic Church. They say America is the land of opportunity, but for some, life isn't so easy. Right now in America, one in six children lives below the poverty line. That's nearly 13 million children of all races all across our country. Where do you draw the line and get involved? You can make a difference in more ways than you think. Go to povertyusa.org today because one in six children in poverty is one too many. A message from the Catholic Campaign for Human Development.